Tenokoto, Tenokoto, Tenokoto Katoa. Um, welcome to the. Hang on, just I'm juggling different things happening at the same time. Um, Koja Lawsonaho, and um, welcome to today's solar seminar. For those of you that may or may not be aware, tomorrow is World Rivers Day, and we thought that it would be a great celebration if we could run a seminar that would tell us a little bit about the three major rivers that um, run through Christchurch City. So today we're very fortunate in that we have Anthony Shadbolt, who will be talking about the Puhara Keke Nui Styx um, River, um, and then we'll have uh, Annabelle Hasselman, uh, ably assisted by her offsider Rachel Barker, talking about the um, Opawaho Heathcote River. And then we'll have Dave Little talking about the Otakaro Avon River corridor. So um, over to you, Anthony. Thanks, Jill. And uh, kia ora, everybody. Um, Anthony Shadbolt, I uh, currently lead. Uh, City Council's Parks Biodiversity Team. Been there for quite a number of years now. I studied out here as a landscape architecture uh, many years ago. We actually with Don and Mark. It's, it's a terrible year. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to be, I've been involved with the Six River for probably 20 years now. And so I'm just going to start off with, with an important um, message. If it, that's not going to work, I'm going to hit that button. That's not going to work either. Oh, the mouse? Teams is working at okay. the same time. So just pressing the screen anywhere. This is the most important one. The local body is actually silent at the moment. So please exercise a democratic right and vote, but do your homework. But um, the reason I put this up here is I came home from work on Friday and watched the, the mayoral debates between Phil Major and, and David Mates. And it was compared by, compared by the editor of the press. And she made the statement that Christchurch is a, a low-lying city based around two rivers in a swamp. Oh, she's talking about the Puharaka Canoe and the Kapite. I thought, no, she's talking about the Avon and the Heathcote. So I was a bit disappointed. Um, I kind of miss some, uh, the best river. I don't say best because it's better than any other river, but the Styx has the best opportunities for restoration from source to sea of all the other rivers. Because it's mainly rural, so we've got opportunities to actually acquire big, wild areas of reserve and do good restoration on it. So, I mean, the Styx is a really important waterway for, for me and for people in Christchurch. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, the Styx vision. And um, it's a vision that was started out by the Waterways and Wetlands team of Council, and Rachel Barker was part of that. And Christine Hiramaya was a landscape architect and a parks planner, and she really pushed the Styx vision um, and made it happen. And she passed away about eight years ago. Uh, but she left a huge legacy for the city. So this is for Christine as well. Um, but there's five key visions in the sixth vision. One was a viable Springford River ecosystem. Um, second one was a source to sea experience, um, living laboratory, place to be in partnerships. So I'm, I'm going to focus on the second one, the source to sea experience, and the, and the living laboratory as well. Um, but yeah, fantastic legacy that, that's been left for the city. And we are, we're halfway through the vision now. So it's a 40 year vision, 2000 to 2040. Just over halfway, and we often think, gee, we've got a long way to go, but we've actually achieved a hell of a lot in that, that short period of time. So the, the second vision, the source to see, had six key um, really objectives. And I'm going to go through these in a little bit more detail. Protecting suitable routes, preventing walkway barriers, so we can actually walk along the thing. Uh, we've got a whole range of different experiences in the sticks, which is important. Um, develop service nodes, monitor and mitigate um, impacts on ecological values and promote it. Now we've done pretty poorly with, with promoting the vision because people think there's only two rivers in Crossfield. But anyway, we'll move past that. So firstly, um, focus on the, the, the bottom part here. Um, identify and protect linkages. So the first thing we've done is we've, we've acquired land. We've had to go and buy land. We have money for it. So it's willing seller, willing buyer scenario. Uh, when people develop land for residential, we can acquire ESMA reserve. We can also acquire smart strips. We can get extra land from reserve contributions. And I've added this, this the fourth one there, location of stormwater infrastructure. Now, the, the council needs to mitigate its stormwater 
discharges in terms of quantity and quality to, to surface waters. And we realise that when you develop properties, you have to you know, mitigate your, your stormwater, but we weren't mitigating the older parts of Christchurch and the catchment that had no, no um, mitigation. So we could either put in proprietary devices at the source, like rain gardens, other proprietary devices, swales, but they're all decentralised and they cost a lot to maintain and manage. Or we could invest in larger downstream infrastructure like stormwater ponds, um, first flush ponds, four bays and stormwater wetland treatment systems. And by getting that, those systems downstream, we could actually supplement the reserve corridor by having these, um, these elements beside the river. So we get a bigger green wedge between the river and the urban development. And in those reserves, we can manage all the six values, uh, drainage, landscape, ecology, recreation, and culture, and heritage. And you can't really manage those in the smaller devices if it's decentralised. So that is the approach that we, we, we developed for the sticks. Um, preventing walkway barriers. Um, we've done a pretty good job of this almost by default, really. Um, the main walkway barriers were the major roads, like the Main North Road, Martian Road, Northern Arterial Motorway, and railway lines. Now, for the main North Road, um, Perry Royal, who actually designed this building, came up with the idea of a, of a walker bridge across the main North Road. So we go over the main North Road, but it cost money, and we didn't have money. So it never, never happened. It might, might come back one day, we hope it will. But in the meantime, um, in the last sort of 10 years, we've, we signalised the intersection. So there's now a pedestrian crossing there. So the, the crossing road isn't so much an issue at the main North Road anymore. A Martian Road, same thing, it's, it's gone from an 80 or 100 kilometre an hour road down to about 60 kilometres, and we've now got traffic lights and pedestrianised signals at, at Martian Road. Um, Kapitahi Coop were real, real on the whole creek to avoid the motorway having to cross it in two locations, mainly for um, maintaining wildlife movement up and down the waterway, but also allows people to walk up down the waterway without being obstructed as well. And um, We've insisted that we, we get access under the motorway at the Kip, upper Kapitahi and under the railway bridge too. So we've, we've overcome all those barriers now on the main roads, which we're pretty happy with. Um, range of experiences. I mean, urban wilderness, I think, is really important. We, we're really lacking that urban wilderness in Christchurch now. So we're trying to get as much wild back in the city as possible. And because we've got nice wide reserves on the sticks, we can manage a whole range of experiences from quite formal experiences in urban parks right through to not like the backcountry kind of feel to being off the track. Um, something else that, that Christian was very passionate about is a, a high sense of natural character. And if we had built structures like artworks and any other built features, they had to be of, of high quality design. So you get that high quality design throughout the catchment. We've, we've done pretty well with that too. Um, as we try to reflect um, all the elements of the sticks and, and art and design throughout the length of the waterway. I won't go into too much detail on the service nodes. We've got a few playgrounds and nature park experiences and a bunch of walkways, picnic tables, barbecues, that sort of thing. Um, car parks, we need, we need more facilities like toilets um, and decent uh, wayfinding, because at the moment, we know we can walk a long way along the sticks, but you don't know where to actually approach and how to get to it. And we've developed a field centre for the sticks as well, um, and we'll talk about that shortly. Um, I think finally, uh, impacts on, on ecological values. I mean, the sticks is, it's got a lot of intact ecological values. It's got bitten and marsh crake and 16 species of wildlife, um, native waterfowl and six more reserve. You've got um, good populations of grey teal throughout the, the catchment, and still you know, really in some quite intact waterway systems. So we're really conscious of being able to zone these areas so people don't impact wildlife so much. We want people to walk the walkway. There's a fine balance between actually having a lot of people there and impacting on, on biodiversity values. And the Six Mill Reserve is a good example where it's zoned in terms of areas of people. So, you know, car parks and picnic areas and activity spaces, spaces that you can walk through nature. Um, so you actually interact with nature walking through it. But other parts of the reserve in the east end, we view it from the outside. So not actually within it, but you're actually allowing space for wildlife to, to do what they need to do, to breed, to feed, and to develop vulnerable populations, really, um, to sustain into the future. 
this is the last one promoting it. Yeah, we haven't done too well with promotion um, because nobody knows it's there. It's on the outside of the city, but the city is moving out to the Sticks River. So all of a sudden, um, in a few years' time, people are going to go, wow, where's this place come from? It's just fantastic. Um, so but we do have a bit of a side of interpretation, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, the Living Laboratory Trust is developing a walking guide to the, to the catchment. And of course, the park rangers and the Sticks Trust are good advocates for the environment too. So often it's word of mouth. People are starting to discover these reserves just straight through straight word of mouth. Um, and so if, if you want to go for a walk on the Sticks, at the moment you can walk pretty much from the source to the sea and you're mainly in reserve system. So if you start at Numbuk Park down here, you can walk to Numbuk Park out to almost to Soy's Arms Road through reserve systems, uh, nicely landscaped. Bit of a walk on the road down uh, Gardner's Road it's slow and but then you get to um where the sticks river crosses uh, underneath the the gardeners road but from that point there you can walk along an esmard strip through sticks mill conservation reserve across the main north road through redwood springs to the northern arterial motorway we've got a bit of a gap there's no land that's in public ownership between the motorway and tawako kakatea but you can head up into the kapitahi up the uh cycleway through the kapitahi realignment belfast cemetery to rua domain then back down through Tewaku Kapuka, through Sunley Orchard to Martian Road and across into the Living Laboratory Precinct. Well, we do need a bridge across the sticks at that point there. From there, um, you can go up Lower Six Road into Shepherd Stream, through Bottle Lake, back out to the Unformed Eagle Road, and right out to Brooklyn's Lagoon. So the red bits are the only bits that aren't in public ownership, but they're on public roads. So look at this, you've got the airport here. It's only a kilometre and a half from the airport, so an amazing tourism potential for people to arrive at the airport, Uber will walk to the side of the sticks and walk right the way through to Brooklands, walk down through Seafield Park to Spencer Park, eventually walk down through Bottle Lake to Travis Wetland to the Avon River Corridor up into the CBD, and you're almost back to the airport again. So an amazing circuit that people could either spend a day and really hate it, or a week and love it, you know, do things on the way. Um, so a great opportunity for tourism. Um, Living Laboratory, I was conscious of time, I'm doing okay. Living Laboratory Trust was set up in 2000, and we have done a whole bunch of things over the past 20 years on a very small budget. Um, we've done water quality monitoring, bird monitoring, vertebrates, and we've advocated for the river. But last year we were given a cash injection from MFE of 4.2 million, to, which is great. You know, you can do stuff with 4.2 million. And we are doing stuff. We're doing eradication of grey willow upstream from Martian Road. We're planting 10 hectares of, of riparian environment, 10 hectares of forest, increased volunteering, and year on year reduction in pests, etc. And we're employing six staff, field staff, and program managers. And it's starting to get a real sort of a real vibe, you know, the vibe of the castle, you know, it's fantastic. And this is cool, eh? <laughs> what? Uh, Dave didn't, didn't sabotage my presentation, I thought he might have, but we're trying to be authentic. So a lot of the plans we've done in the sticks and throughout the city in the, in the past, have, there's something not quite right with them. Like this, you know that's a, that's a mountain lion, you know that's a leopard, you know that's a baboon, that's a bear. There's something not quite right. So we're striving now to be a lot more authentic than we have been in the past. And these aren't unrepairable. We can come back to these sites and, and tweak them and make them Better look. This is from a book called Crap Taxidermy, by the way. Go ahead and look. So I'm going to just very quickly walk you through some some of the sticks. Just it's a beautiful environment. If you haven't been there, make sure you go and have a look. Um, you've got mature and carpetia forest. There's actually more forest in the sticks catchment now than there was in the whole of post-1850. If you can believe that. Um, dryland sites, um, nice architecture. I design that. We'll move on quickly. But the amazing natural values that are still intact. That's a completely reconstructed waterway, and that's Capitaid Creek, man-made. Um, but just great tourism opportunity to actually walk through the space, experience a whole range of different habitats and different landscape features. That's some of Perry Royal's design there. That, that's a natural Waipuna. We're up to eight years ago. There were cattle and horses drinking out of that. Just a muddy pit, and now it's just clothed in Pukia Sage, surrounded by Kakatea. It's got its mana back, dignity. Um, old, historic sites, it's just a beautiful part of the world. Um, and it's not known, you know, people don't know the sticks is out there, but one day people will discover it. 
30 songs. And I'm just going to finish, almost going to finish, um, just by a bit of a thing. Oh, and the finish of Brooklyn's Lagoon, which is an outstanding landscape. Um, but just the Landscape Architecture School here has been a big um, contributor to the six vision. So the Trust has hosted um, interns over the years. So Chai, she did a project with Neil Challenge and myself, supervised Chai. Uh, spatialising the sticks, looking at all the different spatial attributes of the sticks and how to link it all together. Um, Ashley did a project looking at how to incorporate fine scale habitat features for wildlife into the into the into the network because we often just do the planting and don't think about what wildlife actually needs. Um, Sophie did a project looking at how to communicate um, ecological values through art and design. Um, and I mean, this stuff these, these people were doing was right up there with what you'd get out of a top consultancy. Um, Grace did some landscape design work for um, our field centre and private properties that we're, we're helping plant. Uh, Sarah did a project looking at um, how to engage people with, with um, doing work in the environment, you know, what weeds and wind while we're there, you know. Fantastic. And um, Aria, um, latest student, has taken all our summer scholar research papers that were done and, and saved as PDF documents and translated them into engaging interpretation that we got actually the catchment now. So the yeah, Ascat School's been fantastic. It really has. And if you had a lesson tonight, I'm just about done. I am done. Um, the Sixth Women of Botany Trust AGM is on tonight at six o'clock at um, Guthrie's Road, uh, Rui Hall. And we'll be talking about um, bats because we've discovered eDNA of long tailed bat in the Six River in the Kapitahi Creek. Um, we had 169 really strong hits of our, this animal, which has never been seen in Christchurch since 18, 1880, I think, Annabelle, a long time ago. So they're probably there. So we're going to go and try and find them and, uh, and have an AGM, which isn't that exciting. But we do have an artist in residence um, talking to the, the, the the meeting as well, looking at photographing the sticks using old timey bellows cameras. Amazing, amazing work. And I think that's about it for me. And we're bang on 20 past. Thank you, Thank oh. you Anthony. Any um, there's so much to say about these catchments, and you only have 15 minutes. So I really appreciate you trying to condense it all into one presentation. Um, Annabelle, would you like to step up to the podium? Now, do you want to? I'll just put the I don't know how to make it work. But um, so yeah, the flicker. These are the slides, and if you have a point, you can use them. Okay. Yeah. Over to you, Annabelle. Okay. Kia ora, kia ora koutou. Ko Annabelle Hasamana ho. No horena me ingerangi oku tupuna, ifano mai o ki ti maru, ko komera ti maunga, ko ti ana awai ti awa, i tipu aki o ki cave, ke oto tahi aho e noho ana inaine, kanui te mihi kia koto, no reira tina koto, tina koto, tina koto katoa. So kia ora, I'm Annabelle. My ancestors are from Holland and from England, and I was lucky enough to grow up beside the Tiana Awai River on a farm and um, with, the, with Mount Nimrod overlooking us. And now I live in Altatahi, Christchurch. So I really just want to thank you for inviting me here today to celebrate World Rivers Day by talking to you about the Opawa Heathcote River. I don't know, just <laughs> get myself sorted. This presentation, there. Okay. Is it easy just to push that one? That one? Whatever you want to. They, they both keep the same. Oh, it keeps going back. No, that one keeps going back. It's definitely having a day. Right, 
<laughs> so I, I'll just push on it. I'll just push on it. No, it just needed saving on the computer. So you're all good. Yeah. I'm going to take you. Oh, so the presentation today is going to explore the power of community voice and collaborative action to restore the health in Maori of the Apawa Heathcote River. I'm going to take you on a short journey along the river. So where is the Opawa Heathcote River? In the north of the, this image is the Otakaikino, and then the Styx, as uh, Anthony has talked about. Um, in the centre of the of the image is the Avon Otakaro, and to the south, in the bottom of the image, is the Opawa Heathcote River. Along with the Avon Otakaro, the river flows into the estuary, as you can see there on the right. Here you can see it's sitting with the Port Hills in the south and the, the city centre to the north. The, the Opawa Heathcote River is a spring source river, which is fed from the groundwater from the Waimakariri River. Its main spring sources are in Wigram, near Te Punawai, and also at the head of Kashmir Stream. It passes through residential areas, reserves and parklands, through the more modified cut section, this was installed in the 1980s to bypass the loop of the river and increase the flow of water to the estuary in times of flood. It then passes through a brackish salt marsh area before it flows into the Avon Heathcote estuary, which you can see in the top right of the image there. The Opawaho River has been the poor cousin of Christchurch's rivers. A recent Stuff article identified it as a picturesque New Zealand river that most tourists ignore. The Mayor of Christchurch in the last CC, CCC annual plan wrote that the Avon Otakaro River could be the jewel in the crown for Christchurch. But we would argue that every river in Christchurch should be of equal status in the crown jewels. The Christchurch City Council annual water quality monitoring reports summarise the quality of our rivers using an A to D rating. The Apawaho River has a D rating for water quality, sediment quality, and QCMI. It's quite a mouthful. Quantitative macro, macro invertebrate community in index, which is a means of assessing our ecological health, one means. So why is the health of the river so poor? To understand this, we have to understand the history of the river and the legacy issues there. The black maps of 1856 show a city of waterways and, rich, and wetlands rich in biodiversity with pockets of toitoi, flax, cabbage trees, fern grass, scrublands and pockets of forestry. Of oh, forest, sorry. <laughs> Mano Whenua used the river as a travel route from Kaipui Pa, north of Christchurch, to Tewaihora, Lake Ellesmere. In the Māori name O Pawaho, Waho means outpost pa, and there were many pa's, a number of pa sites along the river. The river also provided a rich source of Mahangakai. With the arrival of settlers, the landscape changed. The area around the rivers and the port hills was drained and cleared of vegetation. This image shows a river winding to the estuary with a very barren landscape around it. The river was used by settlers as a major travel route for transporting their goods and belongings to the new city via ferry meet. In this image, you can see the depth of the river shown by the size of the vessels traveling up it. As Christchurch grew, so did the industry beside the Opawaho. By 1883, there were 11 wool scows and 11 tanneries along the, the lower river. Later, there were rubber factories, 
gelatine factories and glue factories. In the early 1900s, a quarter of New Zealand's industry was sited along the river. It is horrifying to think that all the waste from those industries were discharging straight into the river. It was estimated that at one stage there were 5 million litres of industrial waste pouring into the river, our poor river. It wasn't until the 1970s that an industrial sewer was established to take the industrial trade waste to be treated to the Bromley water, water, Wastewater Treatment Plant. So what's happening in the catchment today? This land use planning map gives a little blurred, but it gives, gives a bit of an idea of the typical land uses in the catchment. It should be noted that it is not updated with the extensive subdivisions and stormwater treatment basins that, that are being installed in the head of the catchment. The green area shows parks and reserves on the port hills. The blue indicates grazing on the hill and flat. The large pink area is residential properties which make up a large proportion of the catchment. And the yellow shows the industrial, industrial subcatchments such as Hayton's and Kurtlitz Basin. What are the key contaminants today? Stormwater carries contaminants from our roads and residential properties. And here you can see the large stormwater drains flowing into the river. Interesting, interestingly, in a survey of Christchurch residents, it was revealed that 40% of the population thought that stormwater was treated before it entered the rivers. Sediment in the form of the fine lowest from the port hills and construction sites is another key contaminant. Another contaminant is zinc from the large zinc loom roofs in the industrial areas and also aging unpainted roofs in the residential areas. The copper from the, from the uh, copper brake pads in our cars also enters the rivers via the stormwater network. Other contaminants include rubbish and E. coli from dogs and waterfowl. The history of the river, the land use and the catchment and the contaminants from the urban environment all continue to combine to produce a river, the Opawaho, which has urban stream sy syndrome. And this image here shows all the, those sources that contribute to urban stream syndrome. So how does a community respond to these complex issues that degrade the health of our river? People have a vision. They have a vision for a healthy river and a catchment full of biodiversity and birdsong. People come together to raise awareness, highlight the issues and seek solutions. This image show, shows the initial flotilla up the river in the 1970s that activated a community voice and desire for action from everyone involved in its management. But it wasn't until 2015 when the idea was initiated to develop a community-based ca community catchment group. In 2017, this was cemented with the Opawa Heathcote River Network becoming an entity as an incorporated society and a registered charity. The network began with seven community groups active in restoration in the catchment. It now has, it, it now has, sorry, it now has at least seven community groups active in restoration. It now has at least 22 and it's constantly grown. This map is already out of date. It was sort of out of date as soon as it was printed. As an organisation, our purpose is being a, vo a community voice for the river, advocating for and promoting the regeneration of the health in Maori of the river, and connecting with and supporting communities within the catchment. Our approach is collaborative. We like to see ourselves as the good bit in the middle of an Oreo cookie, connecting the community groups who are the doers, with the agencies who are responsible for its management of the Apawaho River. We've also found that people and agencies work in silos. So the Opawa Heathcote River Network has become the connector of those silos. We're also the initiator, the initiator of ideas. 
we create the ripples of change at the local, regional and national level. As the community voice, we will often inter initiate an idea or a conversation that is then picked up and developed by an agency. Our strategic plan directs our projects in Mahi. This is based on a strong relationship with mana whenua and the concept of te mana o te wai. This slide shows our four main pillars of our work as a community catchment group. The first pillar is around the health and Maori of the, of the river and improving to become a thriving ecological corridor. Our key focus here is seeking solutions with others to reduce the amount of sediment entering the river. This sediment smothers the habitat for anything that lives in the river. It is a complex problem that needs action from all the agencies. Other projects that we are involved in include the protection of springs and the impact of climate change on the river. Our second project is our second pillar is advocacy. This is a key role for the Opawa Heathcote River Network. Through our strong submissions on issues, the CCC and ECAN annual plans and bylaws, national plans and resource consents in the catchment, we have become a clear and credible, clear, credible and effective voice for the river. Our third pillar is around connecting with and supporting the community. We seek to establish a link to raise the awareness of the issues and opportunities around the river. One of the ways is through events such as World Rivers Day. This year, we're going to hold an outdoor pop-up ex exhibition for two weeks, starting on World Rivers Day, Sunday the 25th of September. That's this Sunday. It will be on the pedestrian bridge opposite Zero's Cafe on Kashmir Road. So please come along and check it out. Our fourth pillar is leadership. We invited all our catchment groups to partake in the two-day Tetiriti training course. This provided a foundation for our relationships and understanding working in the water space in Aotearoa. Nationally, as a collective, we are also involved part of the Cawthorn Institute's research for the this is a real mouthful too, for the, for the research for the New Zealand Biological Heritage National Science Challenge. And it's looking, this project, we're looking at community collectives and the shared learning between those collectives to amplify ecological restoration. Here we are with one of our initial, initial hui re related to that research. Restoring the health in Maui of the Pawa Heathcote River is a very complex problem. Resolving it will take time and commitment from everyone. In this process, we have come to realise that it's all about people working together. And fundamentally, it's all about relationships. So here we are. We're on this journey for our children and, and their children after them. And we'd love for you to come along and join us. Thank you so much, Annabelle. Great presentation. Now, Dave, are you online? I am online. Um, Would you like to share your screen? Yep, I'll just share my screen. One second. I'll hand over to you. I'll find the right, here we are, that's the right program. Can we all see a flooded road? Yes, the floor is all yours. Right, and um, and people in the theatre there can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Fantastic. All right, all afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Dave Little. I started um, at Christchurch City Council last year, early last year, as the planner for um, the residential red zone, and in particular the Otako Avon River Corridor. Um, and then earlier this year, um, I took over as the manager of the, the same outfit where my previous manager, Brendan, went over to head up civil defence. 
Um, apologies for the background noise. I'm in a quiet room that isn't particularly quiet because the um, the hand drive from the loos keeps going. So that's what that noise is in the background, if anyone can hear that. Um, so today at the session, what I'm planning on covering um, is just a bit of context around the River Corridor um, in terms of its historical, its cultural and its ecological aspects. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit to the regeneration plan, how it's developed um, and how we're planning to implement it. Um, I'm going to cover off the principles and the objectives of what we're trying to achieve out of that um, and then look at finish up by looking at um, sort of time frames and some case studies of work that's currently being undertaken. So a bit of context, it's an interesting area. Um, people will probably um, be fairly familiar with it, but um, for those who aren't, I'll give a bit of an overview. Um, so pre-European times, um, this was a site that was largely based around Mahingakai gathering and um, and sort of a transport route between some of the settlements towards the where the CBD is now um, and out into the Tihutai, the estuary. Um, there was also some settlements at um, Waikakariki and um, just north around Travis Wetland that can be seen on the map there. Um, so no particular um, significant settlements in the corridor itself, but very heavily used for gathering of resources and food. Um, and few images or uh, sort of pictures um, of that time exist, but um, the images on the right look roughly how it would have been in those times. Um, and then as Annabelle alluded to, um, once Europeans appeared, the landscape changed dramatically. You can see over the course of um, sort of 20 to 30 years in the 1800s, um, a lot of that riparian vegetation was stripped out. You could see houses starting to appear. Um, and then sadly, by 1865, we had willows lining a lot of the river corridor, um, and we're still um, dealing with the fallout of that today. Um, stepping back in time a bit further, um, the black map's an amazing resource. This is a, a great image of um, the previous vegetation or the underlying natural vegetation in the corridor overlaid against the lidar, um, so the topography. And you can see really clearly through the corridor here, um, all the low-lying flat wet land that went on to become the land that became a problem in the earthquakes and was ultimately red sand and the housing removed. So a real cautionary tale, I think, of um, sort of city development and why draining wetlands um, and sort of fighting natural processes is not the greatest idea. Um, moving the ecological slide forward a little bit to our current context, and, and this is a fairly similar story to the one that Annabelle just told. Um, the current report card isn't great reading, um, so on a, uh, a score of A to D, um, the river scores slightly better than Opawaho, uh, but not by much. So the water quality index um, is, is C, that is um, reflective of, of things that are basically floating around in the water, so a lot of that's the heavy metals um, and some of the biological contamination like E. coli. Um, the sediment quality is, is terrible, it's the worst there is, um, and that's the pollutants that fall and get trapped in the sediment. So primarily here it's things like coal tar, which, um, which aren't soluble, they, they tend to sit down in the sediment there. Um, the macroinvertebrate community index is C, um, and what they're studying there really is the types of animals that live in the water and how susceptible those are to pollution. So. As your water quality and your sediment quality improves, that rating comes up because you get more of the animals that are uh, um, requiring cleaner water. Um, at the moment, there there is still life in there, but it's the sort of life that tolerates really poor water quality. So that's what that's picking up. And overall, we got a score of D, poor, um, which indicates moderate to severe pollution within the river. So just turning um, our attention to the formation of the regeneration plan and, and what the plans are moving forwards. Um, so a lot of people here might have been quite young at the time when the earthquakes happened. Um, so just a quick summary of what happened through this area. Um, 8,000 homes were um, red zoned in total due to land damage in the earthquake sequence. Um, and 7,500 of those were in the flatlands, um, so around Kaikoi, Brooklyn, South Shore, um, and 5,400 of those within the river corridor itself, which is a, a huge number of people that were displaced. Um, what it resulted in was around 600 hectares of open space um, running both sides of the river corridor and largely following that flat land area shown in the black maps. Um, interesting couple of stats. Um, on average, the land within the corridor dropped by about half a metre, which is why it suddenly um, started looking really wet and why a lot of the underground services no longer worked. 
Um, and so that comboed up with sea level rise means that the permanent, well, I'm not supposed to say permanent, but the long term stock banks um, envisaged under the regeneration plan are going to be about uh, a metre higher than the, um, the current temporary stock banks that you see along the edge of the river. Um, so just a couple of shots um, from 10 years ago um, showing the two key aspects really that caused the land to be red zoned. Um, the first being liquefaction. So the easiest way to think about this is um, if you go to the beach and you um, get into the wet sandy area and you kind of shake your foot around, um, your foot starts to sink and, and water and sludge come up. Um, and that's exactly what happened um, through most of the corridor. Um, and then what this map is showing here is the other aspect that the corridor had to contend with, which was lateral spread. So when that land gets soft and slushy and starts to move around, um, it heads to places where it's not constrained and the edges of river um, rivers aren't constrained. And so basically the land starts to tip into the into the river and you get cracking all along the edge of it as a result as it starts to effectively widen out and expand. Um, so the red areas here show where there were significant areas of cracking. Um, and again, you can pretty easily pick up the, the corridor from those red areas. So it's pretty clear why the land got red zoned. It was um, primarily around the cost of um, re-establishing all those houses and then uh, additionally the cost of re-establishing all the services which were all up and down and would require a huge amount of money to fix um, with no certainty of, of this event not then re-happening and having to spend that money all over again. So the decision was made to um, stop fighting the natural processes and return it to um, a, more of a natural situation. So the houses came off, that's a drone footage of a couple of years ago and is fairly reflective of what you see out there today. Gives a good um, indication of the size too. So the, the corridor itself, if you can follow my mouse, runs all the way through here. You can see it's still over the back here. Gets a little skinnier here and then terminates out towards the estuary at Bexley. So <clears throat> this is, you're probably looking at about two thirds of it there. It also heads in towards Townmore. So a massive area and um, one that offers a huge amount of opportunity for the city. So the region plan took about, um, I think it was about five years. Some people on the call would probably know a lot better than I would the, the exact process, um, but there was a huge amount of community input into this um, and the ecological components in particular were extremely well supported. So there's a huge mandate for us to deliver this in terms of um, there's no appetite for redeveloping, putting buildings um, or housing back into it. We're certainly tasked with delivering um, the best practice ecological outcome for the corridor here, which is great. Um, so looking at a couple of uh, looking at the principles and objectives and how we're going to deliver on the plan. Um, the region plan had seven objectives. Um, practicing the Hingakai, returning the ability for this area to be used for resource gathering was really the primary um, objective. And a lot of these other ones that sit underneath that are there because they're good in their own right, but also because they support that primary objective. Um, and the two that I'm going to focus on today are regenerating nature and living with water, because they both relate to this topic the most closely. Um, so looking at the living with water aspect first, um, there's a bunch of different considerations that we're looking at as we um, as we implement the regeneration plan. Um, first of all, stock bank planning. So this little photo here shows the current situation, which is gravel banks lining the river. Um, they don't give us um, a lot of ability to do anything ecologically to those river margins. And if you have to increase their height by about a metre, they're incredibly that's incredibly expensive to do so. So the plan via the region plan and in the subsequent work that we've been doing is to take out these temporary stop banks, which you can see from this sort of orange dotted line, um, and push those right back as far as we can possibly get them. Um, that means that we can build them lower because the um, the land further away from the river is typically a bit higher. Um, they're cheaper to achieve because the geotech constraints are, or the geotech aspects are better. Um, and it means that we can naturalize the edge and we can disguise them a little bit with some of our site one fill. Um, what it does mean, you can pick up from this um, image, is that probably the city to sea path will end up in many cases on the river side of those stock banks, um, which means that every so often you might get your feet wet. And there's a bit of a discussion around what um, height exactly we should be setting that at. Um, it's also important to note that there are things we have to have behind the stock banks. So typically that is things like any edge housing, um, as well as stormwater management areas. And I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail on that later on. Um, the next is stormwater planning. So around a third of 
um, the city's stormwater urban catchment flows out into the river. And as Annabelle mentioned, um, that's not treated at all. So basically, whatever nasties come off the road, the rubbish, the brake pads, the heavy metals, um, the oil, everything just goes straight into the river. Um, so via the Regen plan, um, there's going to be about 17 stormwater treatment areas delivered over time. Um, and these will all um, not only retain floodwaters, but also treat those um, contaminants before they get pumped back um, as relatively clean water into the river. Um, <clears throat> these do have to be behind the stop banks um, because we can't have them being flooded during flood events and then all those contaminants that are supposed to be getting treated um, just washing straight out. Um, so there's some aspects around um, having to have pump stations for each one and then how we get the power to those. Um, but the, the main thing is that we're trying to get these to be not only well well designed engineered structures, but also really high quality landscape structures with a, a great sense of place and potentially doubling up as things like viewing. Um, there might be viewing platforms, there might be art included. Um, so we're looking at trying to make these um, aspects that contribute to the landscape as opposed to taking away from them. Uh, the next aspect is edge habitat and wetlands. Um, so what we're doing in general terms, where we can, is we're going to be easing back the riverbanks. Um, there's a few great reasons for doing that. One is that um, Inanga, which is a, a key um, Mangakai species and a, a nationally protected um, fish, um, like to spawn along the edges of the river um, within what's called a saltwater wedge. So there's a certain area of the river that they like to spawn in. Um, and there's a certain height that they like to spawn at as well. And so by easing the banks back, what we do is we create a much larger shelf for them to spawn in. Um, and it also means that as sea level rises and the height in the river goes up, um, that their habitat will be able to migrate back. It won't get trapped in a spot where it then um, effectively goes underwater and, and is removed as a spawning habitat. Um, it also means that we can get a lot more vegetation in there, which um, gives a greater diversity of habitat as well. Uh, we'll be doing looking at things like shading of the river, which will lower the water, water temperature and putting an overhanging vegetation um, and maybe some obstructions, um, which are places where lots of um, vertebrates and invertebrates like to live. Um, and then another aspect that we're looking at is creating um, back wetlands, which is when we'll open up um, areas of the river to uh, inundate either tidally or in floods. And again, when you've got that um, semi-permanent inundation with water, you get really rich ecological habitats and, and different ones that you wouldn't get normally in the river. Um, so lots of thinking around that, around that edge margin and how we're going to treat that, but it will be quite different to how you currently see it. Um, I think the final aspect under living with water is improving the in-stream habitat. Um, so there's a few ways that we want to do this. Um, one of the primary ways is to clear out blockages. So you can see here horrible culvert um, that we're going to take out at Porrock Park. Um, obviously blockages in the river are, are not good um, for its health. Um, it's a reasonably easy one to achieve in most instances. It just um, just takes a bit of consenting and a bit of uh, a bit of money. Um, we're also doing um, investigations um, into what exactly is driving some of those um, water quality health indicators and coming up with strategies to help mitigate that. Um, and we're looking in the upper reaches at increasing the base, um, the variety of the base conditions. So at the moment, it's all largely um, sort of a muddy based um, river. But uh, what the ecologists are telling us is that uh, upstream of about Porrock Park, which is about halfway, um, there is the ability to start to introduce uh, pools and riffles and runs, um, which are the sort of things that you see um, around the CBD in the river. Um, we start to get water bubbling over rocks and it adds a bit more extra oxygen um, into it and increases the ecological niches of, of animals that can live in there as well. Um, and then, oh sorry, and then moving on to um, regenerating nature as the other um, key aspect that we're looking at. Um, one thing that Ant um, continually beats me over the head with is that we need to be applying restoration principles and being ecologically authentic. So um, we can't just be landscape architects about this. We need to be proper ecologists. Um, so the idea is that we're trying to replicate natural habitats. Um, we're definitely using eco source material. Um, and what I'm going to talk about on the next slide as well is um, the thinking that we'll be working with natural processes and patterns rather than uh, trying to re-establish our own even when it comes to things like planting. Um, we're also in quite a unique situation within the corridor that we've got a dedicated team um, on this project, including um, operational um, guys, so rangers and um, PGMOs, um, and we've got multi-year budgets, which means that what we can do is 
once we've established, say, new vegetation of, of something like, say, Carex, um, and that comes up, takes over, smothers the weeds, we can then come back and do tertiary planting of, um, secondary and tertiary planting of forest species in appropriate locations as well. Um, so we have got the ability to do quite good succession planting in places that, um, that suit it. Um, we're also looking at landscape ecology principles, so building up core areas of habitat, um, making sure we've got the buffer zones right, um, and then connecting them via corridors or, um, or patch ecology. Um, one thing that um, has been a bit of a learning for me on this project is the idea of returning the ecology to its natural processes. So particularly when we um, head out towards the coast and we get into the more saltwater environments, um, the ecologists are very, um, very keen for us to largely let nature do its do its bit. So set up the um, situation for the natural processes to re-establish themselves. But rather than planting um, some of our re-established benches, for instance, um, where we've eased back the the edge of maybe the estuary, um, just to basically leave it alone, and um, the salt water will basically kill off the um, the exotic grasses that are currently there, and they'll also bring in seed stock of the types of um, plants that like to live there. So it may look a little messy for a year or two, but it's a way of achieving a much more um, long lasting and legitimate plant community there. Um, so that's one thing that's required a little bit of a head shift for me, being a, a landscape architect who likes to plant things at 500 millimeter centers in a triangular grid. Um, and so all of these things lead us hopefully in the future towards a restored environment where we can um, once again practice Mahanga Kai. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for why that's a good thing, um, and some I've listed them out here. Um, reconnecting people with the land, um, there's tourism opportunities, there's education opportunities, there's interpretation opportunities, um, and there's things like processing centres that we could potentially bring into, into the activity zones as well. So um, there's a heap of different ways that this might generate tourist activity throughout the corridor, in addition to being a genuine resource for uh, people from the city to use. Um, and one other interesting aspect is that Otako, the name of the river, um, one of the interpretations of that definition is that it was um, it was called place of play, so Takaro being play, um, and that references the fact that the, um, the adults would send the kids um, to play in the river and play games while they were gathering the Mahingakai. So that's um, something that we're looking at picking up on through, via the design of some of these projects. Um, so just quickly, because I think I'm slightly going over time, um, looking forward to implementation in a couple of case studies. Um, Here's the regeneration plan grayscaled with um, some colourful images showing the projects that we're actively working on that are in the investigation and design phase at the moment. Um, so blue are being led by the water team because they're primarily um, stormwater management areas. The green areas are being led by the parks team because they're mainly parky type areas. Um, and the yellow is the city to sea path. The idea is that almost all of these projects um, will be it will, will attempt to consent next year. Um, and then from the following summer, which will be 23, 24, um, the construction works on most of these should begin in earnest. So it's a decent program of work um, and it's requiring um, quite a lot of effort from quite a lot of people in the industry at the moment, which is great. Everyone's beavering away, including probably some of the people on this call. Um, there's a lot of things to consider. I'm running behind time, so I'm not gonna go into those too much, but it's a lot. Um, so a couple of quick case studies. First is um, the Waitaki Basin, which is currently under construction. Um, it's this area here. Uh, this was a couple of months ago in a flood. This area is trying very hard to return to um, a floodplain. There's stormwater management area involved. Um, so this will just take a few seconds to render. Um, so what we're looking at here, Pages Road, um, these are the um, landscape plans for the project. Um, the city to sea pathway will run in between the stormwater management area and a tidal wetland along the top of the stop bank that's going to uh, basically protect the stormwater management area from being inundated by flooding. Um, the temporary stop banks which run along the edge of the river at the moment um, will be reshaped slightly to become roosting islands and then um, holes will be chopped in them to allow this wetland to inundate tidally. And this will be one of those areas that is just going to restore itself naturally rather than being planted because the conditions should be okay for that vegetation to re-establish itself. Page study two, I am getting towards the end, I promise. Um, is looking at Avon Park and Avonside Drive. Um, so this is towards the middle of the corridor. It's just um, Pirate Park sort of over here. Um, and what we've got here is a, um, it's a recreational reserve. 
um, with an area of low-lying land that due to the earthquakes um, no longer drains properly because the stormwater system sits at a level that is below the high tide level of the river. So that means that if rain falls um, when it's high tide, it's got nowhere to go and it just sits there as a big puddle. So rather than raise the road and fix that situation up, what we're going to do instead is take away the uh, stop banks, take away the road, um, return the park most likely to a wetland and allow nature to do what it wants to do through there. Um, with this being an indi indicative type of result, um, looking from that same viewpoint. So we are going to be taking away some of the grass field area that the community likes to use, um, but we're going to spend a bit of effort making the top terrace, which is further back here, into a much more um, high impact usable space. So they get um, probably more recreational elements out of that space than they currently have out of the whole park. Um, and then they get this amazing restored wetland with city to sea path and connections via a, a bridge that we've recently built as well. So it's sort of trading off um, ecological versus recreational aspects there as well. So I'm done, just about on time. Um, little summary, very complex area to deliver projects in, very hard to consent, um, but we were working hard to try and return it back to the, Hing the Hingakai environment that it once was. And we're doing that via stop bank improvements, stormwater improvements, river edge improvements, in-stream improvements and vegetation improvements. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. That was amazingly uh, comprehensive in a very short period of time. I'd just like to, because we're